The marvel of jet travel. It must have been designed with Australia in mind. Big distances in a big country. Our flight time, Sydney to Darwin, would get you from Perth to Jakarta, London to Athens. Right now, with the camera gear aboard, we'll be off to film another progress report for the Ranger Mine Project. But first, a diversion through Darwin, for it's important to our story. Not every mining project has ready access to a capital city, with international airport and deepwater seaport. But Ranger has, and both the mine and the city's commerce benefit. Like the mine's 100-ton generator sets, sent direct from Japan to Darwin. Within 48 hours, local transport had delivered them to the mine site. A short drive south, and then it's due east along the Arnhem Highway to Ranger, a few kilometres from Jabiru. Our last trip along a familiar route to film the finale of a three-year construction drama. For within a few days, the Ranger plant is scheduled to commence production. Hey, gents, back again. Yep. Entrance gate. Sealed roads, a sign for the tourists, a sign of progress, really. It was nothing like this three years ago. Just a small signpost in the scrub. Impossible to film as we bumped off the end of the sealed highway onto a dirt track. That was February 1979. The place had the relaxed air and charm of a bush town. In fact, a caretaker staff had lived there waiting for seven years while various governments deliberated the fate of Ranger. While the official go-ahead had at last been given, the current wet season saw the project off to a slow start. March 79. The ground dries out. The heavy loaders move in on site. The start of the main camp for unmarried construction workers. Within months, essential services are completed. Sewerage, electricity, laundries, a mess hall. The camp at peak accommodating 1,200 workers, providing each with an air-conditioned room. <laughs> to accommodate transient worker families, a 250-site caravan park is laid out. For permanent staff families, two- and three-bedroom cottages constructed. And to satisfy all interests and age groups, a recreation centre completed. Thank you, Mark. Face the water. Swim. In mid-79, we were back at site filming the groundbreaking ceremony, delayed until the dry season. Galaroy Yunapingu was the first speaker, then chairman of the Northern Land Council, which had concluded an agreement with the government entitling the Aborigines to many millions in royalties from the Ranger project. That's agreed. And in the establishment of magnificent national parks so that this land is protected, available for all to enjoy, and an example of how people with varieties of interest solve their differences for the good of all. Thank you. 
concluding speaker was the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, the Right Honourable Doug Anthony. The initial production will be 3,000 tonnes of yellow cake a year. The foreign exchange it will earn will be sufficient to pay for one third of our oil requirements at present level. Environmental impact, Aboriginal land rights, feasibility studies. Years of investigative reports carefully analysed and then the rules laid down. Now at last, the Ranger project was officially launched, destined to play a major role in the economy of the Northern Territory. Back in Sydney, engineering planning accelerates, for the initial period of construction would be crucial. In the tropical north, the seasons alternate each year between wet and dry. The project becomes a race against time. Six dry months in which to move materials across a continent. To dig down, then build up foundations to ground level before the next rains come. A site engineer comments. Well, if we don't make it in time, we'll end up with some mighty big swimming holes around here, I tell you. Take this excavation for the primary crusher. About 106,000 cubic metres of material to be removed for a hole that has to take a 10-storey building and all formed up, concrete poured and repacked with earth during the short dry season. Then there's the tailing stand, our biggest earthworks project. Four kilometres of wall to go round there. But first we've got to dig down and blast below the weathered rock zone, then blow it clean. That way it'll bond firmly with the clay fill to make an impermeable wall. Next year after the rains, we'll raise it to the required level, adding a filter wall outside as well. She'll hold the tailing, that's the waste products from processing, under a permanent covering of water. By the end of the dry season, the pace was on filming the final preparations to beat the wet. When the rains did come, in the steamy heat of November to March, it was Mick Oldham who captured the action with an 8mm camera poked through his truck window. A record 8 and a quarter inches, or 210 millimetres, in one six-hour period. But there was one event the rains could not dampen. The Jabiru Annual Boat Race, held that year on a much swollen Magila Creek. Okay, still one. exceptional rains, the earthworks hold. First stage walls for tailings dam and retention ponds effectively controlling the runoff. The mines environmental division starts a program of monitoring to ensure that silting of natural waterways is minimized. Hydro mulch and seed applications have stabilized the new embankment. Special techniques allowing the establishing grasses to resist heavy rainfall erosion. The free plant nursery is enlarged to encourage home gardeners to plant indigenous trees and shrubs. A certificate course in horticulture is introduced to help young Aborigines play an important scientific role in the care and preservation of these northern lands. The uh, drainage. For, uh, subsoil. The students are enrolled from distant communities, uh, as right there are there. few Aborigines living within the Ranger Kakadu area. Very good, good. In all, six distinct scientific disciplines are established in a fully equipped laboratory to monitor and protect the complete ecosystem, including chemistry, radiology, hydrology, and botany. Today, 
the Ranger Site and Kakadu National Park are amongst the most thoroughly monitored land areas in the world, ensuring a compatible balance between the ecology and the mine. Buffalo fences, recently erected, have already given a new lease of life to local fauna and flora. Well, Ranger's construction program had weathered its first wet season, and as if to usher in the new phase of activity, and with style, His Excellency Sir Zelman Cowan, Governor General at that time, visited the site during a tour of Kakadu National Park. What His Excellency found was a young established community of 1,500 people involved in family and sporting activities and, as our camera boys found, extremely friendly and helpful. This time, the delineation of number three ore body is completed, confirming a potential as large as that of number one. A combined ore reserve that will keep the processing plant operating for 30 years, provide a clean energy equivalent of 3,000 million tonnes of coal, or theoretically supply Australia's current power requirements for 90 years. With the overburden removed from number one ore body, the Radiation Safety Division starts continuous monitoring of work areas. Now too, personnel possibly exposed to radiation must wear dosimeters to record any cumulative exposure. Over several months, the average readings prove to be little more than those from cosmic rays and ground sources to which we are all exposed every day. If you are working in a mine site, you'll be working We learnt these facts and more at one of the mine's weekly induction courses. Interesting, well presented, with topics ranging from safety to environmental objectives and Aboriginal rights. Details about welfare and amenities were included. You want to play any sport up here? Name it, you've got it. Interzone sporting activities, social clubs galore, and that final seal on sophisticated living. The box comes to Jabiru. Taped programs from Channel 8 Darwin transmitted daily on site. Life will never be quite the same. The third and final year of construction started with both the plant erection and the wet season stubbornly coming in on schedule. Man versus the elements. season and flooded highways in Queensland delaying the transports, we'd never have made that second year on time if it hadn't been for the truckies and the riggers. To make matters worse, the commissioning chart drawn up by management for year three set us some pretty tight target dates for the start of each section. 
At the head of the list was the primary crusher, our 10-storey high structure, most of it now underground, including the crusher components and the shaft with five inspection levels. Right now, we're installing the ventilation system that'll exhaust any radon gas given off during crushing. And by the time the electrics are hooked up, the whole unit should be ready to start. As target dates draw near, work accelerates. Thousands of tons of structural steel to be erected. Hundreds of kilometers of power cable and piping. Over 2,000 pumps and valves installed, tested. Actually, the first area to reach target was the powerhouse. Only six months after we'd filmed the diesels and generators arriving at Darwin, the first of five was installed on site. With three units online at a time, they'll burn a road train of fuel a day, supplying power for the mine complex and for the new town of Jabiru. 10 kilometers west. Jabiru has been attractively designed around an artificial lake and has the facilities you'd find in a large modern town. A community center, shops, a school shown here, and all air conditioned. The move over from the mine's temporary township had already started. The first official residence Nick Jastremski, a shift boss at the mine, his pretty wife Dee, and their three children. Ranger's general manager, Don Woods, officially hands over the key, and a town, a community, is born. <laughs> Within 18 months, the 220 air-conditioned dwellings for ranger personnel would be completed. The mine's contribution to the town's development would exceed $60 million. Eventually, the town will serve all mine and government interests in the Alligator Rivers region. Population should top 3,500. the town and the black-necked stork that gave it its name, Jabiru, exist within the bounds of Kakadu National Park. The park, which borders Arnhem Land, occupies over 6,000 square kilometres. The ranger operations, adjacent to it, 16 square kilometres. In isolated pockets, there's some fine wilderness scenery and prolific bird life on the floodplains. early days, we'd filmed the overburden in the pit being removed by contractors to build roads and dam walls. Now, the mine's own heavy equipment had arrived to extract the mineralized material. Virtually the start of 15 years of continuous mining at Ranger's number one ore body. Before the equipment arrived, we'd worked out the pit planning and safety procedures so that we could swing straight into action in the mine. Three and a half thousand to nine is the ratio. That is, three and a half thousand tons of ore mined for nine tons of yellow cake out of the plant each day. So, from the outset, we introduced two shifts to keep ahead of our stockpiles. 
to grade each load, it's firstly read by a pair of scintillation heads, which measure the amount of radiation from the ore. Then a computer converts this reading into ore grade, records the data, and directs the driver to the appropriate stockpile. We'll have more than enough stockpiled for the primary crusher when they start her up. May 2nd, 1981. On top of the fine ore bins, a somewhat informal ceremony is taking place. The Australian flag, flanked by those of the Northern Territory and Rangers flying Jabiru, symbolises the project's joint endeavour and marks the start-up of the first main stage equipment in the plant, the primary crusher to be commissioned with the first load of rock material that morning. the final phase of testing and adjustment to bring the whole plant into production by October 1981 as scheduled. Primary crusher, can you tell me what levels the ore is coming on? Within weeks, the primary crusher is running to planned capacity. Conveyor belt systems commissioned and working under load. Secondary crushers and 19mm screens producing a constant supply of fine ore. Rod and ball mills grinding these fines into a wet slurry. The leaching vessels with acid dissolving the uranium into solution from the unwanted rock and feeding the lot through the six thickener tanks for mechanical separation. The heavy underflow, the mineral wastes, treated in the neutralization plant and distributed within the tailings dam under a protective covering of water. Clear overflow, the uranium in solution, fed through clarifiers, filters, to the solvent extraction tanks, where kerosene and chemicals concentrate the mineral. The final stages are reached. Precipitation with ammonia, separating uranium from solution. For the first time, uranium diurinate becomes visible as yellow clouds infuse the liquor. Go ahead and check the torque density, then see if that's ready. Sure. The density looks good. Talks one percent. Why don't you go ahead and switch it over, Mike? The closed circuit is now bypassed. The slurry diverted to a centrifuge, emerging as 70% solids. In the furnace, this yellow cake is calcined to a green powder at 600 degrees Celsius. Within hours, it has fallen to the storage bin, ready for loading in drum number one. Hi, Larry. You can start it off. most systems initially worked well was cause for congratulation. That the finished product, assayed at above specification, was an added bonus. The date, August 13th, 1981. Enough time left to fine trim the whole plant and hopefully bring it to full production by October as originally planned. In the event, the Ranger project commenced production on schedule and within budget, at a total investment of $330 million. Our work was done. In the process, we'd borne witness to the birth of an isolated mining complex, created in effect from the skillful melding of sciences, engineering expertise and trades. Now, at last, the noise and clamour of those years are over, muted to a steady rumble. The satisfying sounds of a new industry, a new community at work. Mm -hmm.